Well, hello there. It is good to see you again, and welcome back to Go Beyond Numbers. I am your host and moderator, Ryan Ruff. It's great to be back with you all today. And as always, I'm joined by my right-hand man and the star of our show. That's Mr. Tony Rose. He'll be jumping aboard in just a second. But we also are going to be featuring another special guest, as we've been doing here lately on the show. Today, we have joining us Dr. B.J. Fogg, who is a behavior scientist over at Stanford University. Dr. B.J. Fogg had also authored the book Tiny Habits, which was a New York Times bestseller book and also won book of the year which was designated by amazon back in 2020 so we're really excited to dive into a lot of great things with dr bj today talking about these tiny habits talking about you know how really behavior can work in so many different ways shapes and forms in our lives really really excited to bring him aboard but first let's go ahead and say hi to the man of the hour tony it's good to see you how are you doing today sir i'm doing great ryan it, it's uh already mid-year already know, it's gone is very fun. fast yeah it really is well tony bef before we bring uh you know bj fogg out here and, and get into the conversation today why don't you frame things up for our audience a little bit on you know how you met bj and and why really you wanted to bring him onto the show today to, to dive into his world of of you know behavioral science as i've t as i've talked to uh everyone watching or listening to this uh, over the last year I am a member of something called Genius Network, uh, unashamedly called Genius Network, which is an organization of entrepreneurs that gets together uh, periodically during the year, culminated by a, a big annual conference. And through the founder of Genius Network, Joe Polish, uh, he, I don't exactly know how Joe met BJ, but he presented BJ and the book Tiny Habits to us, and I read it voraciously. BJ was kind enough to do a weekly discussion group uh, for an hour uh, for the number of chapters. I don't know, there's eight or nine chapters of, of Tiny Habits. There's 10 chapters, and it was really, really a wonderful time to hear about habits, relationships, all kinds of things that BJ is doing in the Behavior Lab. I then signed up for BJ's boot camp, which was all remote, uh, which was more intense. I think it was four or five sessions, four hours at a time, which was really, really wonderful. I, I regret that it happened during the pandemic because I did not get a chance to go up to Northern California and be with BJ for that uh, boot camp, which would have changed the texture of it a bit. Uh, we became very friendly. Finally, in an all disclosure, as chairman of Genius Recovery Foundation, we have been very interested in the work that BJ is doing uh, about the uh, intersection of relationship and addiction recovery. And so we are in the process of discussing with BJ how we can best support that and uh, we, we may talk a little bit about that uh, during the next uh, 30, 40 minutes. Fantastic. Well, with that, we want to go ahead and welcome Dr. BJ Fogg. Great to have you aboard Go Beyond Numbers. How are you doing today? Hello. Hi, Ryan. And hi, Dan Tony. It's, oh. I've been looking forward to this. I'm, I'm so happy to be talking with you. Well, I'm, I'm really thrilled that we're able to have such an expert and such a <laughs> A, a pioneer in behavior research as B.J. Fogg. And also, I want you to know that in my time in the boot camp talking to his associates, uh, th these are a group of extraordinary people doing very, very important work. So, so I want to do, I want to do a couple things today. I want to talk about, we'll talk a little bit about tiny habits. But I think you've probably gone beyond tiny habits. Uh, and tiny habits are a tool. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and talk more about your most important work that's going on at Stanford right now. Make sense? Yeah, love it. Perfect. So um, how did, how, and, and by the way, I recommend the book Tiny Habits to anyone watching or listening to this. Uh, pick it up. 
It's a very easy read. It's a fun read. Uh, it'll get you to uh, floss your teeth. And, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, for me, it was doing uh, the tiny habit I, I tried to pick up and, and get bigger was doing planks, you know? So if any of you do exercise, you do a plank. And I started off with a 20 second plank and worked myself up to a two minute plank. And if those of you that have ever done planks know two minutes is a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Anyway. Now, now Tony, let, let, let me add there. I mean, earlier Ryan said it was the, the, the book of the year by Amazon. It was the best business book of the year, which is still kind of amusing to me. It wasn't written for you know, business purposes, but Amazon saw how it applied there. And I think it's relevant to what we're talking about in this audience is it is a book that yes, planks and flossing and things like that, but it helps you understand how behavior really works. And it helps you get very uh, practical about how to create habits, including those that optimize a business. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's very important. I, I actually think Tiny Hamp is a very important business book which has been distributed throughout my business. And, and um, one of the biggest problems I had before Tiny Habits is that I thought you had to think big mm -hmm. and act big to get big. And I believe, BJ, maybe you can expound on this. It's actually think small, behave small to get big. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would agree with two of those three that you just said. It's a little nuanced. Um, yes, think big, think huge. Um, one of our colleagues, two of our colleagues published a book called 10X. You know, how do you 10X what you're doing? But the way you put something big into practice is the two other things you said. Um, it is what doesn't work. It's just like to have this big, you know, ambitious objective or goal and just try to motivate yourself or others toward this abstract thing that leads to fits and starts and frustration what does work is breaking that big thing you want to achieve down into specific habits that you would do on a regular basis and then designing those habits so they're really easy to do so you get traction right away and you feel successful right away and success leads to success and you do achieve big things in that way uh, without violating any specific confidences, can you tell us a story about people that were thinking big and started small uh, in developing habits? Give us some. Can you give us an example? Yeah, I, I'll give. I'll give one, and then I can follow on with a whole bunch of them. I get I get emails every week of people saying you've transformed my life. I just got one from a woman in China who just read the Chinese edition. Um, well, one big transformation is a woman who was addicted to sugar and tony she came to my boot camp in person and the first thing she did was introduce herself by her name and said oh i'm addicted to sugar which is not what the boot camp's about the boot camp's about designing for business uh behavior change but but then when she learned the methods of behavior design what i taught and tiny habits, she started applying it and she kicked her sugar addiction. I think that's really big and it was very big for her. Another example is um, a father who's been very successful with growing a business in the health space and had a bad relationship with his adult son who was living at home as a lot of that is going on. And it mirrored in some ways, the tension between him and his son was sort of a repeat of what he had with his father, and he promised himself he would not go down that path, but yet it was happening. And by using the tiny habits method, he was able to shift that relationship. I mean, it was it was rough, but it was just as simple. <laughs> it started, and I tell the story in the book, essentially, he figured out what is the one behavior I can get my son to do that would help him feel successful and help him feel like he's cooperating. And it was just take the coffee filter out of the high-end coffee maker that the dad had and put it on the counter. And once his son, his son said, yeah, I'll do that. 
and started doing it. And then it led to a whole cascade of other changes that then made their relationship, it transformed their relationship. Um, so here was this really hard, two part puzzle: sugar, I'm addicted to sugar. And my relationship with my son is exactly what I didn't want to have. And through using the tiny habits method and doing small things and making those changes led to transformations in both areas. Uh, it, it, is the boot camp accessible to anyone or how, how do it, if people read tiny habits and they want to learn, yeah. how do they do that? Well, there's two flavors of training uh, that I offer. One is in the tiny habits world for people who are coaches and want to use the tiny habits method. So that's, we, that's tiny habit certification. The boot camp is different. The boot camp is a broader, as you know, Tony, but for everybody listening, the tiny habits method is a specific method. My work that I call behavior design is a broader set of models and methods. Tiny habits is one of those methods. So in the boot camp, I teach people how to use my models and methods for business purposes. So it's not like, you know, come and learn to kick your sugar addiction. That may be a, a side effect, but the planned effect is you can create really effective behavior change solutions systematically and with a team and building consensus and uh, by not guessing. It's a system and it includes testing and validating what you're doing. Is it open to everybody? Not really. You have to be working. You have, I, I mean, there's some hobbyists. Back in the day, there used to be like lawyers and MDs who would come just because they could afford it and they thought it was fun. And we don't really admit those people anymore. You've got to be working on some product or service to help people change in a positive way, in a positive way. So uh, people designing you know, gambling apps or whatever, no, we don't want to. But um, if you are designing a product or service that hinges on behavior change and you're helping people uh, become happier and healthier and more financially secure, yeah, th those are the people that, because the space is limited. It's 10 to 12 people per training, whether we do it in person or on Zoom. So it's uh, kind of limited and I won't be doing these forever. So the, uh, so we, we, we screen and, but we also make sure it's a really good fit. Like if it's not a good fit, we just tell people it's not a good fit and here's other resources. Yeah. The, the, now, um, I, I, I know in, in, in my particular case, uh, I actually didn't know I needed it as bad as I needed it. <laughs> but when, when I took it, uh, because we were just beginning the challenge of working a uh, remote, and in and in uh, my business, we went from having fifty plus people in the office a day to having sixty people, fifteen of which come into the office, yeah. and the balance are in uh, ten other states. Yeah, and and uh, I don't know whether you you have any specific advice for how to create a group solidarity and, and everyone to pull the wagon towards the same conclusion. In our business, we want to be wow. We want to be accountants that people won't operate without. Yeah. And, and you do that by loving them, by caring for them, caring for people but we all got to pull the wagon the same way. So it ha has what you've discovered about behavior design and, and design for more effective uh, impact uh, yeah. changed with remote? Oh, let me step back a little bit and do kind of a meta comment. Uh, Tony, when you said caring for people, you and I have talked about this before. Over a year ago, we talked about this and you got emotional then and in if people rewind this and listen, you 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 got a little emotional. You you really believe that, and I so admire that. I mean, I I I love that is a key driver for you and your company. I just think that's terrific. Now back to the question at hand. Um, I'm going to answer it this way. One of my models I call the Fog Behavior Model, 
and it's the cornerstone model for the other models and the methods. And it's just by helping your colleagues understand that model. And that is a model that describes how behavior works and it's a universal model. And I'll give a quick summary. A behavior happens when there's three things that come together at the same time. There's motivation for the behavior. There's the ability to do the behavior, how easy or hard it is. And there's a prompt. There's something that says, do this now. And it turns out that is the solve for behavior. All behavior can be described in those terms and you design using those terms, motivation, ability, prompt. And to get your team, whether it's in person or remote on the same page, understanding that these are the components of behavior. These are the three levers that we can adjust to get a behavior to happen. If a behavior is not happening, it means one of those things is not happening and you can troubleshoot that and do better. So whether people are remote or in person, having a shared way of thinking about behavior and an accurate one and a shared language around behavior. And the behavior model is, like I said, the, the cornerstone of a foundation. And there are other models that will give people a shared way of thinking, a model as a way of thinking, and a shared language so people can collaborate better. And I guess maybe the twist here, Tony, to your question is, that's even more important when people are remote. Clear communication is much harder to do when people are remote and um, you, know, you have to be really deliberate uh about interacting and so on and so the costs of communicating poorly around behavior are much higher i think i would guess with remote teams and the uh, likelihood to uh either have your what would you say misinterpreted or have it take people in the wrong, wrong direction is much higher so the need for a shared language and a shared way of thinking is important for everybody but especially for people working remotely. Um, yes. Now, now, um, and and you, of course, had to with your students work remote for a long time. <laughs> Are you still remote? No, no. I am on campus teaching this quarter. Um, yeah, during COVID. Uh, that was rough on the students. In some ways, it was more convenient for me, uh, but it was rough on the students. And, and we're back, and I'm back on campus, but not in a classroom. I've arranged it. I bought, <laughs> you don't want to know this. I bought a whole set. I bought 35 little camp stools, huh. and I check them out to the students on the first day of class. And we meet under these two huge oak trees at Stanford, which is like weird and different, but that's how I do everything. And the students bring their little chairs. And on the last class in a couple of weeks, they'll check them back to me. And um, it's really great to be sitting outside under these massive oak trees talking about tiny habits. And this class is specifically using behavior design or tiny habits to create and strengthen relationships. Uh, and uh, the last podcast uh, we did was with Dr. Patty Ann, your friend, Dr. Patty Ann, and it was all about relationships. Yeah. And, and, um, and so, let, so let's explore, let's explore your behavior work around relationships a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, great. Talk more about it. What do you find? What What are you seeing? And in, in what What oh, are gosh. you trying to fix that needs fixing? <laughs> okay, let me start with what needs fixing, then we'll get into what I'm seeing. And there's just so much to share. I'll be brief, Tony, and you can have me drill down deeper on a topic if, if I'm too brief on a topic. Um, the students... Stanford students are not immune to the effects of the pandemic and to just generally what's going on. People are much lonelier than they have been. Yeah. And yeah, there's people that have always been lonely, but it's much higher. And people are anxious and people are discouraged. And the students are especially frustrated because it's like, man, we worked so hard to get into Stanford. And now we're sitting in our parents' basement doing Stanford classes. This is not the experience we wanted. And that leads to it seems 
I say it seems I measure it directly, but I've had an unusual number of MBA students in my class, you know, one of the top MBA programs in the world. And one of the things I learned, oh, I think it was about two years ago. In fact, they came to me and said, BJ, we want a course from you because some of their colleagues had taken my course. And I said, I'm not teaching right now. And they're like, well, we want one. So I created a special course for uh, them. Um, and one of the things I learned is they are lacking confidence, which just trouble it was like really and i think part of that is they just didn't get the experience uh being a remote that they thought they would and they feel like they'll go out with this mba but not really the sufficient training or relationship so that's the context and then my position at stanford i relocated to be part of the medical school and it's the part there's a part of the medical school that cares about the well-being of the students which is so I shifted my research that direction, shifted my classes that direction, and away from some of the other research projects like, okay, let's do the teaching that's all about helping the students be happier and healthier, and let's have my lab do research on those, and especially on relationships, and helping them, not quantity of relationships, and I've made that very clear uh, in my lab and to the students in the class, but it's the quality of the relationships because that is what determines largely how happy you are. It's not the number, it's not the social media <laughs> followers, it's the real quality relationships. So at this point, Tony, I could go into the buddy mapping visualization and drill down and talk about that, but let me uh, hand back to you to redirect if that's not a good way to go. Um, so so well, well, let's go back to what needs to be fixed. Okay. And 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 you you've now said uh, people lack confidence. Yeah, that was a surprise. That was a surprise. But yes, they're lonely, and and in the Stanford students' case, so I taught a class last fall that was all about business relationships. And the thing that I think was a revelation to the students in that class was the thing that got you into Stanford, working alone beating out other people, competing, and so on, is not the thing that after here is going to serve you. It's your relationships and your ability to work in teams and your ability to work collaboratively. The whole game changes. And so start now at Stanford. That was the point of class. Start right now. Work on teams. Work on uh, volunteer projects. Don't worry too much about your grades. In fact, I had some great guest speakers come in and basically, your grades don't matter here. What matters is you building those strong relationships, not a network, but those relationships of people that you will work with for decades to come. And that was essentially the premise of the class. And it was a revelation to most students that they should <laughs> not obsess about their grades so much. And they should obsess about figuring out who they are on a team or a project and who else they need on the team or the project to be successful and build those relationships now so you have them for decades to come. One, one, one of uh, the capitals that I talk about in Go Beyond Numbers is the concept of social capital, which is just that. And, and, and I think I, I talk about relationships. Um, and, and, and when you think about relationships, not only with your friends and family, but with your colleagues, with your customers or clients, with your vendors, and even your uh, competition mm -hmm. as being a, a possibly more valuable asset than the money you have. Yeah, yeah, and and um, so so I I believe relationships are everything. Uh, the other thing is that um, I think, and and my son-in-law just graduated University of Southern California with his MBA. Great, and uh, uh, he was very frustrated by the teams that he was in because people had varying degrees of seriousness. Hmm about their commitment to each other hmm. um, and, and 
Um, and they talk about networking. So you go to networking things. Yeah. And networking, I remember when I was younger and doing networking things, I was a smoker. I would basically go to these networking things and sit in the corner <laughs> and smoke because I didn't know how to develop yeah. relationships. Mm -hmm. um, any comment about that? Well, you would. So I went to university in the 80s and 90s, uh, early 90s. And back then, we were, I was meeting people constantly. And I was, I mean, really, every day I'd meet people and I had all these social interactions and so on. That has changed. I know it's changed at Stanford and it seems to have changed elsewhere. Um, I, I'm going to, I think this is accurate. It all started with, the downfall started with the Sony Walkman. It started when people put headphones on their ears and started walking around in public, which meant I'm busy, don't talk to me. And that's now extended to ear pods and technology and so on. So what would happen once upon a time, just automatically in our lives is now gone. And to break the ice with somebody or to have a more significant discussion with somebody without them looking at their phone, you have to be really deliberate now. So there's a, and that's a big part of the, the teaching at Stanford and some of the innovation we're doing in the lab is those of us who live back in the day, that's not coming back where this all happened naturally. Now we have to help people very be quite deliberate and create habits and routines and practices around starting and strengthening relationships. And it's not natural for Stanford students, and it's probably not natural for most young people, um, just because of, in, in some ways, technology. And it's not just COVID. Technology's had, a, I think, a huge effect on how we uh, have changed. It's changed how we interact. Well, and, and all the small talk, all the small talk happens here. Oops. Yeah, yeah. There we go on the phone. Tell me holding up the phone. It happens here. <laughs> See, it's funny. It's it's hidden. There it is. It, yeah, it's disappearing. <laughs> all, all, all the fun stuff, all small talk happens on text. Yeah. So no. so so we you're you're, you're um, I was flying in from Los Angeles into Las Vegas uh, yesterday afternoon. And and uh, the man sitting next to me across the aisle from me looked at my briefcase and said, "Wow, that's neat. That's a neat. It, yeah. My briefcase is a backpack, and yeah. and that's a, that's a neat Thule uh, backpack." And we started doing small talk. And on that airplane, as we were waiting on the tarmac, punching punching our machines, we were looking. Oh, let's see if we can find that, and you can go ahead and order it. And we and it was very nice little interchange but the first contact my heart started beating fast yeah hmm. because people don't talk to each other anymore wow yeah the, you know, the, 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 i mean I, you're certainly not alone tony i mean the culture has shifted and in some ways it's just easier to put on our headphones or act like we're buried in our ipad or something like that but good I, for I, you I, I know um our friend joe polish published a book earlier this year uh, uh, which is called uh, "What's in It for Them." I think Great you book. actually, I think you might actually be in that book. Yeah, I think I'm in the book, but I'm also a huge fan. We read the book in my Stanford class on business relationships. Joe was a guest speaker. They loved Joe, by the way, Tony. I think I told you that we had. I don't know if I want to name drop, but we had some pretty notable people in the class, and you know, more like recognizable from a name perspective than Joe, but man, the students on the midterm evaluation said, bring back Joe. We want more of Joe. There's something about his authenticity and his just, he's all about relationships, but he helps other people also form the relationships, which is what Gian is doing for me and you and so on. And it was so, and he's so different his background in the Stanford students, and they really admired who he was, what he struggled through, and what he is dedicating his life to. 
so yeah and so we we uh in the class we only read uh well two and a half books and one of the books was joe's book yeah so so what is his prescription for relationship well it's i'm gonna just not do it um justice but it's really understanding how is the other person suffering it's empathy it's empathy it's like understanding and then providing value and providing um helping them with that thing that they're suffering around or struggling with yes and the name of the book is what's, what's in it for, for them yeah, yeah what's I mean, in it said, for them said, yes so the the, the um did I pass? Did I pass the quiz, Tony? <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, you did very well. And 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 the issue actually is in uh, business networking. Most people are trying to figure out what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. And and Joe completely turns that around. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know how I got involved with Genius Recovery Foundation. I don't. I know you are involved, and but I don't know how you got involved. So, so um, it, it, in the in the uh, second annual event that I went to in two th 2017, um, I, I quickly realized I quickly realized that in order to build relationship you have to be able to offer something uh, to people of what you are. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, and um, I couldn't figure out a way, I couldn't figure out what it was in this august group. And I think in that room were 350 people, all of them I thought were significantly better than me. Mm -hmm. and, and what is it that I could do? And, and Joe, uh, talked about a work of art called Black Star. And, and I bought one of them, uh, one of the printed copies. And uh, I said, the only thing I do is accounting and tax and, and do what I do. That's what I do well. Um, I'm a lousy golfer, but I'm a plus one handicap when it comes to accounting. And, and uh, uh, so I said, I'm going to help Genius Network folks in any way I can. And uh, one of the things I discovered is that Joe had a vision for a not-for-profit uh, helping change the conversation of addiction. Yeah. They, they, he didn't have the not-for-profit status, and he really oh. didn't have an organization. I didn't know that. And, and so I went to Joe and said, look, let me help you do this. And so I was instrumental in hiring the attorneys and the consultants and what we needed to do to get Genius Recovery Foundation off the ground. And, and I'm, now, I'm now the chairman of Genius Recovery Foundation because my contribution is that. During the pandemic, Joe said, oh, no one knows what to do with PPP and what's going on and what to do with our businesses, that our businesses are closed. Would you get on? would you get on with, with our mutual friend, Jim Dew, and talk about him. what's going on? And, and, uh, and, and so that's what I do. So my function kind of is to be around, to give curbstone advice sometimes, most of the time actually, to people that need it in our, in our group, but, but I'm very proud to be able to help um, in in this addiction recovery effort, and 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 uh, Joe defines uh, addiction as mm -hmm. lack of relationship. Yeah, yeah, as disconnection. That, that that was. Let me come back to that in thirty seconds. And um, Tony, I think you undersold yourself. By a lot. Yes, you're great at accounting and running an accounting firm. But in addition, you are somebody who really brings compassion and love to your interactions, including business interactions. And I've been impressed. You're so effective at getting things done. Like I'll email you, you email right back. So there's a lot more to um, uh, Tony Rose, of course, than what you said.
Thank you. But let, Thank you. Let, 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 let's go to what Joe said. Yeah, I was at a Genius Networking meeting and they were saying, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. And at first I was like, I don't think so, right? This was the first time I'd ever heard this. And I was like, really? So, you know, as a, you know, behavior scientist, a social scientist in general, you're just taught to be skeptical and look at things and say, well, how do we know that? And is that really true? And so on. And then as I sat with that, I would say it was about a year, you know, it just kept coming back and, and seeing things from Joe's perspective, genius recovery foundation perspective. I was like, oh my gosh, I just started seeing the truth of that. And that really inspired me at the time my lab was relocating to the Stanford, within the Stanford Medical School. And I thought, planets have aligned, not only for me to teach and help students, but also do the research on it. And once we get things working well with students, expand beyond Stanford to other students and to workplaces and so on. And so as you know, that's what we're doing. And we're breaking new ground there and it's working. You know, we're not ready to like, go out of the gate and say, we've solved this, <laughs> you know, this problem uh, fully, but we certainly are making good progress in helping people understand their relationships and strengthen the relationships. And each class and even the workshops I do on this, I mean, I, I measure everything, right? Or not everything, but I love measuring stuff. And so we measure, you know, pre-test, post-test in the class, the 45 minute workshop we've done with Stanford employees, pre-test, post-test and so on. And what we're doing works and it helps them feel less anxious. It helps them uh, feel more connected to the organization, what we're doing. And we're not measuring you know, addiction issues directly. We did ask that question in the course, but that's not the focus yet until we really know we can help people reduce their anxiety, um, feel, uh, well, in increase their motivation to build the relationships, provide them with guidance on how to do that. So a big part of the project is the how-to, which I can talk about if you want in the context of the class. And it is, I would say, Tony, this is of, so I've been directing a research lab at Stanford for 25 years, 25 years. This is the most exciting topic I think we've ever studied in my lab from you know from my perspective i just i'm not seeing this ending for us this is just like let's keep going let's get better and better but and we used to do three projects at once we streamlined it this is our sole focus is to how do we help people change their behavior to strengthen their relationships so they can be happier and healthier and to genius recovery, you know, less susceptible to the urges of addiction, less susceptible to the negative effects of past trauma or future trauma. And the, the thing is, how do we help people get really good at strengthening relationships and the focus of this week's class coming up in two days, keeping relationships strong. So we call that platinum relationships. Uh, so we, we come up with a terminology to like describe that. the different types. Yeah. So, so when you, when you think about it, and, and, and I've been fortunate, I've never been uh, in an unhealthy addiction. I know I've been addicted. Uh, uh, when you are addicted, it's not a very social thing. I mean, when, when, when you are under the influence of anything, it's not because you're sitting around BSing with your friends. It, it, it in fact, it disconnects you. Uh -huh. And when you think about uh, the solution, uh, addiction as a solution for people might be a very bad solution. In fact, it almost mm -hmm. always is a very bad solution. Yeah. But it is a solution, uh, as as Joe explains, and and um, and it disconnects you. So one of the antidotes because when you're connected, you, you, you are going to have a higher probability of having help with the solution you need that is an alternative 
to that bad solution that you picked. Yes, and, and I think that's part of the puzzle for sure right there that there are people that you can call in or at least feel you can call in even if you don't. Um, another part of the puzzle is when you are feeling down and low and you may turn to the addiction, the fact that you better understand the strength of your relationships or you built those rather than turning to an addictive substance or a practice, um, the hypothesis is, and we'll, we'll study this more systematically as we move along, is that you are less likely to turn to that addictive behavior if that um, trauma or that anxiety can be addressed through the social connections and the strengths that you feel there or the strength you actually get there. And part of it's perception, part of it's perception, which is why the visualizations we're doing, I think are so important. So we are really coming to the end of our time. This, this, uh, it feels like we've only been talking for five minutes. I know. And it's been 40. <laughs> uh, and and uh, is there anything we should be asking you that we haven't asked? Um, yeah, probably lots of things, um, because we could go on and on on this topic. I'm trying to think of the most practical things for people to take away. Um, the system that we're developing is called buddy mapping. And at some point, you'll be able to find everybody resources on how to do your buddy map. But that's doing a visualization of your closest relationship. So that inner circle around you, and it's literally a circle around you that you draw or you use the, the tool we're creating. The next level out, so you have a middle circle and you have an outer circle. You don't have to go find our buddy mapping tool to do this. You can just put me in the center of a piece of paper, draw a circle around you, label that inner circle, and then the, a second circle and a third circle, and then start putting names of people into one of those circles. And you will see, you'll get much more clarity about who's really close to me, who can I draw on in times of real need, your inner circle. You don't need tons of people in there. In fact, uh, Roy Baumeister out of Florida, he did a paper in the mid-90s that influenced me massively. It's called The Need to Belong. He thinks the maximum we can manage in our inner circle is six relationships. You need one, and or you know, but you don't really need six. That's the max. But you need somebody in there or you won't do well. And then you have that second level out that we call level two. And then the acquaintance level that we call level three, your outer circle. And part of what we're doing is how do you take people that are strangers? What are the actions that you can then move them into that level three? So they're acquaintances. And in our class and in our research, we're getting really specific. Like what are the actions that you do? What are the habits that you do? Then once somebody's in level three, how do you bring level three people into level two? And that's a different set of actions. That's a different set of habits. So we're defining that, what those are and testing those. And then if you want more people in your inner circle, going from level two into the inner circle, what are the actions uh, or habits that you do for that? And so each one has a different set of actions that move people closer to you. Um, and then this week, like I said before, we're looking at how do you, once somebody's in your inner circle, how do you maintain and keep that relationship strong? Okay, and we have ways to visualize and oh, names can, for each of these. I yeah. cannot wait to, to read about this work because that's really good. Interestingly enough, if you look in the book, in, so, in my Go Beyond Numbers book, in Social Capital, you'll find a construct um, uh, actually not dissimilar to the buddy map yeah. about, about relationships, although I kind of turn it around because what I found in business is that in business, there's huge power in the power of acquaintance. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in your inner circle, everyone knows everyone and everyone's heard every idea or most ideas. And so that tends to be more insular. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a huge thing on the power of acquaintance. Um, if people want to uh, 
learn more about your work, do you have a website or something that people could go to to read? Yes, I have a few. Let me give three here. <laughs> the the overall is bjfog.com, bjfogg.com, tinyhabits.com. And then if people want to dig into the behavior model, I do have a website just for that, including videos to show how behavior works over time at behaviormodel.org. Um, and so that's your motivation, ability, and prompt yeah, yeah, awesome. which is like the fundamental solve for human behavior uh, right there. So those would be the resources to go to, I would say. I, I hope, BJ, you'll permit me to invite you on again. I think we just scratched. I would love to. I would love to. And we could get into some of the specifics. Like we talked about what emotion do you feel when you take a stranger and you move them to be an acquaintance into that level three? And there's an emotion. There's actions you do to achieve it and there's an emotion and it's different emotions as you go from three to two and two to one and i'm just trying to tune my students to that because emotions play a huge part in habit formation they also play a huge part in relationships and it's different for different um i would say strength of relationships you know this is this is really by the way thank so, you yes i'll come back. The work, I'll absolutely come back because <laughs> of the work we want to do at genius recovery foundation um in supporting your work uh you actually, in this 45 minutes, 50 minutes that we spent, helped me get in my mind how really important it is that this effort of yours be supported. Thank you. Well, you've uh, uplifted and inspired me, Tony, and through the foundation as well. And even before we were talking about that, um, I'm so glad that we became an acquaintance <laughs> and then stronger. So, and thank you so much for inviting me to join you. I'd be super happy to come back, talk with you and Ryan in the future, for sure. So grateful for your time. Ryan, take it over. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, I really appreciate you both carving some time out of your respective busy days. I think there's a lot of value we left out there for the audience today. But uh, and again, folks, if you are interested in learning more about BJ's work, uh, you know, the book, Tiny Habits or any other uh, you know piece of information that you found beneficial in today's discussion, you can always head to that link at the bottom of the screen that we have up there now. But uh, look, hey, with that, we're going to go ahead and say so long, but we appreciate all you guys stopping by and being with us. If you did take something away from today's discussion, make sure you hit that subscribe button then on whichever platform you checked us out on. That way you never miss out on another great conversation between Tony, myself, one of our esteemed guests. And, uh, you know, look, the goal is to provide value for you and yours out there in, in one, one, uh, one form or another. Before Tony and BJ, I'm Ryan. We're going to go ahead and say so long, but we appreciate you stopping by and being with us on Go Beyond Numbers. <laughs>